boss and Pierce meet up at a bar and start discussing their next move. The raid on the penthouse was nice and all, but what boss really wants is to see Loren dead. Pierce believes that he's hiding out in Syndicate Tower downtown, but Boss thinks that Loren's smarter than that. One lead they do have is a designer gun store in town called Powder. Pierce saw some of Loren's goons speaking to the owner, so there's gotta be something they can get from there. During the drive to the spot, Boss gets Shandi on the phone and tells her to meet them there. The trio makes it to the store and briefly deliberates on how to get inside, but Shandi has a simple solution. What about the inside, motherfucker? Put in your tampons and let's do this. Unfortunately, Shandi underestimated how many people would be guarding the back alley leading to the warehouse, because these guys have this place more guarded than the Pentagon itself. Then again, this isn't really much of a challenge for these guys. After all, if they can do a raid on an entire penthouse, they can definitely handle a shootout like this. Once inside the warehouse, we're greeted by not only foot soldiers, but snipers as well. It's best to get rid of the snipers as soon as you can, because they'll just be a nuisance as you try to navigate the place. After blazing through the Morningstar before us, we have to fight a minigun brute. Remember what I said about these guys being particularly dangerous and annoying to fight in tight spaces? Yeah, this dude's gonna give you hell if you come to this fight without the proper health and damage upgrades. The brute gets taken down, and a bunch of Morningstar rush towards their death. We make our way upstairs, gun down some more enemies, and we finally reach the manager's office. The guy must have dipped some time ago, so Shandi decides that she's gonna steal some info off of his computer. This places us into one of those sections in games where we've gotta fend off a bunch of enemies until the bar reaches the end. Shandi gets what she needs off the computer, and we're good to go. The mission ends, and guess what? Powder's not a store you can buy anything from. Would have been nice for it to be a gun store where you can buy more expensive and top of the line weapons whilst also being able to customize their skins. Thankfully, weapon skins would become a thing in Saints Row 4. The day finally arrives. Boss feels like they've waited long enough and tells Pierce that it's time to go after Loren. The plan's pretty simple. Go to Syndicate Tower, kill our way through, and assassinate the man himself. Boss gets Shandi on the phone and tells her that it's time to make a move on Loren and to meet them at the penthouse. Preparations are made, and it's finally time to go after the Syndicate chairman. We're also treated to a slow motion shot of the trio walking towards the camera, and there's no denying that that's badass in its own right. On the way to Syndicate Tower, Boss asks Shandi if she's sure that she wants to go through with this, and she's 110% on board. She wants to make sure that Loren gets what's coming to him for killing Johnny. Once again, still concerning that Pierce shows little emotion about losing Gat, remember that bomb we stole from the National Guard when we arrived in Steelport? The other Saints are going to be driving it into the loading dock so that we can use it on the tower. We make it to the parking garage, and as expected, the Morningstar are there on high alert. After clearing out the enemies, Boss decides to stupidly arm the bomb before entering the tower, putting us on a 16 minute time limit. Bomb setting the clock's ticking. Why didn't we wait to do that until after we kill Loren? That's a really good question. We should move. The time limit's nothing to worry about, to be honest. It's actually a pretty generous time limit, the more I think about it. All you have to do is just not get bogged down in gunfights and keep it moving. Loren stops the elevator we're in on a random floor, knowing that the Saints would try something like this. This floor turns out to be a cloning facility where all the brutes we've been fighting are made. I love how this game goes from a zany action comedy to Metal Gear Rising for like one level. After we kill everyone in the lab, the trio makes their way to a room where a very large man is being strung up by his limbs. His name is Oleg Kirilov, and the reason the Syndicate is keeping him here is because they're using his DNA to make clones that possess his strength, but not his intellect. Oleg's on board with killing Philippe, not that it took much convincing, and the trio sets him free by shooting his restraints. The guy doesn't want to talk about his past and tells us that as long as we're an enemy of the Syndicate, we shouldn't have anything to worry about from him. We finally have Loren in our sight, but he escapes via an express elevator that leads to a basement. Getting desperate, Boss jumps onto some ceiling thing? I don't even know what to call that. Anyways, Boss latches onto it and asks Oleg to knock it loose so that it'll crush Loren. I don't even know how Boss knows the exact spot that it's gonna land at. While Oleg is busy detaching the ceiling thing, we've gotta hold our own for a little bit. The ceiling thing comes loose and falls down several stories. On the way down, a brute latches on, but he's quick.
quickly swatted away. Okay, so the next scene is really weird because of the strange way it's edited. You see the problem? Back when I first played this, I thought that Philippe survived and was standing somewhere else away from where the metal sphere hit the ground. This is all thanks to that sudden cutaway from Loren and the lack of blood at where he was standing. I didn't even find out until hours after playing this mission that Loren got crushed to death. I'm gonna put Loren's death on the back burner for a second because we still have a bomb to deal with. After making it to the parking garage, the player is presented with a choice blow up Syndicate Tower and earn a permanent respect bonus, or keep Syndicate Tower for yourselves and earn a permanent cash bonus. On all my replays of Saints Row the Third, I always go with the option to keep the tower. The reason why is because, well, I never really cared about earning respect in this game, and it's always nice to have some extra cash in my pocket too. Another reason I chose to keep the tower is because it feels like something the Saints would do had there not been a choice given to the player in the first place. I have some unfortunate news though. Even if you don't destroy the tower, this place is never made into a crib, which makes no sense at all. It's really strange that this place isn't a crib, especially after what we did at the penthouse. They're fine with us taking over the penthouse, but the lines drawn at Syndicate Tower, former headquarters of Philippe Loren himself? This mission and the ones leading up to it also demonstrate that the pacing of this game's story is too out of control for its own good. To reiterate, the Saints arrive on enemy turf and on that same night, they attack a military base and steal a bomb that was going to be used for god knows what. Then in less than a few hours of playtime, the Saints have already raided and taken over both the Syndicate penthouse and Loren's tower. That brings me to Philippe Loren himself. What a tragic waste of a villain. In the marketing, and even in the game itself, at least the early parts, Loren is presented as this big bad kingpin who has control over every nook and cranny of Steelport. In an April 2011 issue of Game Informer magazine, the marketing team or whoever hypes the absolute hell out of Loren. I even made fun of this on my community tab too. In the end, what did all this hype amount to? Loren getting katamaried in less than a few hours of playtime. After the attack on Syndicate Tower, we're brought back to Stillwater, where Monica Hughes, widow of the late Richard Hughes from Saints Row 1, is opening up a memorial bridge built in his name. The Saints are also on this bridge, with Gat's body in a hearse, presumably so that they can bring him back to Stillwater and bury him. Unfortunately, this celebration is cut short when the Luchadors launch a surprise attack on the Saints. The Luchadors give chase, not letting up, and causing one of the Saints' vehicles to be thrown into the waters below. The camera then pans in on Kilbane, with him and his men firing rockets at the Saints, but the volley is somewhat unsuccessful. Kilbane fires the last rocket, scoring a good shot on the hearse and knocking it off the bridge. Surviving the ambush, the main cast realizes the kind of danger they're in, especially since Kilbane doesn't seem like the type to shy away from assaulting a funeral procession. Oleg knows some people who hate the Syndicate as much as we do, and he knows where to find them. Back on shore, Monica Hughes is understandably pissed, and she's heading back to Capitol Hill to discuss the bridge incident with the federal government. Returning to Steelport, the trio are getting ready to rescue one of Oleg's associates. The first one is a woman named Kinsey Kensington. Kinsey is an ex-FBI agent, and that rightfully sets off red flags with everyone. But Pierce tells us that she was fired most likely because she had some potentially damaging info on the Syndicate, leading to the Deckers setting her up for termination. Right now, the Deckers are holding her captive on a barge in the middle of the river, and we've gotta go rescue her. We make it to the barge, kill our way through, and we find Kinsey tied up. She doesn't seem excited about being rescued, but that's because she's waiting to see if we were sent here to kill her. Once Kinsey's untied, she gives us some info on the DeWinter sisters. The DeWinter sisters are keeping a rival pimp named Zemos captive at their BDSM club, SafeWord. They locked him up because they were facing some fierce competition from him when it came to prostitution in Steelport. 
teleport. Shawnee's gonna take Kinsey back to town while Pierce and Boss break into Safe Word and rescue Zemos. Kinsey gets on the phone and thanks us for rescuing her and reveals that she has info on a third person that we can recruit, she just doesn't have their location yet. The duo arrives at the club and let me just say that it's about to get really weird from this point on. You've been warned. When Boss starts shaking down one of the patrons for info on Zemos, he gives us the info alright and he wants us to hit him. No, no. No, I'm not about to take part. I'm not even kink-shaming either, because, dude, that lady's in the room with you for a very good reason. Go ask her for that. So we go and shake down some more misguidedly horny patrons until we find out the location of the manager's room. The manager's found, shaken down, and we find out where they're keeping Zemos. We find Zemos being kept in a basement tied to a... <sighs> tied to a pony cart. There's more reinforcements headed our way, so we hop on and get out of there. The Morningstar is also chasing after us on pony carts too, and guess what? These niggas explode if you shoot them long enough. I'm not kidding. The chase is over, and Zemos is finally a free man. Thanks to his smoking habit taking a toll on his throat, he has to speak through an electro larynx. Except Zemos... This is a rescue, right? <laughs> this ain't some elaborate setup for a gangbang. Why you gotta put that image in my head, bro? Yeah, he took a few too many pages from T-Pain's notebook. We get a phone call from Kinsey, who has info on the third contact. His name is Angel de la Muerte, and he was Kilbane's tag team partner in the ring until they had a falling out. Because of this, Angel's been holding on to a years old grudge against Kilbane and is more than willing to help us if it means he gets to settle the score with him. Right now, Angel is at his gym, but he's being attacked by a squad of luchadors. Oh yeah, and Zemos is tagging along too. We make it to the gym, and these dudes are carrying out a full-on assault just to get to one guy. You'd think that Angel was John Wick with the way they're gunning for him. Halfway through clearing out the block, Oleg joins the fight. After wiping out the first hit squad, the trio meets up with Angel inside the gym, but there's little time to chat, as there are more luchadors outside. Oleg actually saves us a headache by taking on one of the brutes himself while we deal with the rest of the cannon fodder. What's really neat about Oleg is that he goes out of his way to engage brutes on his own, leaving you an opportunity to lay down some firepower on them. Not only that, but sometimes he'll pick up weapons dropped by other brutes such as the minigun or the flamethrower. He's definitely one of the best homies to have by your side in gunfights like these. Three brutes and dozens of luchadors later, the gym is finally safe. At a random meeting spot, Kilbane has gathered the DeWinter sisters and Matt and poses a question to them. Who will lead the syndicate now that Loren is dead? Matt suggests that leadership be transferred to the DeWinters only to eat a nasty chair shot courtesy of Kilbane. At this point, Kilbane has pretty much strong-armed his way into leading the syndicate. Back at Saints HQ, Boss is introducing the three new lieutenants, but not without dropping the iconic line. Talk to one of these guys, they'll have things for you to do. It's our time now. Let's get this shit started. So the next series of missions from the new lieutenants is pretty much just them introducing us to past activities, each with their own little storyline. For Angel, he wants us to be prepared physically and mentally for a battle with the luchadors. So how does he go about training us? By having us throw ourselves into oncoming traffic, putting on a fire suit and riding around an ATV while we're on fire, and driving a convertible with an angry tiger in the passenger seat. You know, Angel, we could have done something a lot more practical, like, I don't know, crippling something the luchadors has stakes in? What's with this Sergeant Hartman-ass training? Jokes aside, a series of unique missions from Angel involving Boss doing some weird or intense training under his watchful eye would have made for a pretty heartwarming and charming bit of story. Imagine hearing Angel reminisce about his glory days with Kilbane while he has you walking barefoot across some burning charcoal whilst trying to do some target practice. This was the perfect opportunity to have some unique mission design alongside some exposition, but instead, it's another excuse to reintroduce activities from the last game. A fucking tiger? If you're fighting the luchadors, you need to be ready for anything. A fucking tiger? Don't lose the message in the method. You mastered your fear. Up next is Kinsey. Her series of activities starts off with us helping her move into her new place. We're then told that she can't help us until she tracks down where some of the Deckers are at. I mean, outside of Shawnee's ex's place would be a good start. Anyways, this introduces us to a new activity, one that I forgot to mention in the prologue. 
This one's called Trailblazing. Trailblazing is pretty much an obstacle course where you ride around in cyberspace in a race against time. It's pretty simple when it comes down to it. I also love how the design team decided to do a throwback to Tron with the aesthetics on display here. Just like Angel, the next few missions is just Kinsey introducing missions from the past game, except for Guardian Angel. With all of that done, we've created enough chaos around the Decker's neck of the woods to be able to take on Matt Miller. One way I'd improve Kinsey's introductory missions would be to have at least half of them be stealth-oriented. Not on the same level as Metal Gear Solid or Dishonored, but something a little basic. That would have been fitting given Kinsey's background as an FBI agent and her computer expertise. Remember, throw out your phone! And finally, we go and do some work for Zemos. We're pretty much just going around and putting the screws to the Morningstar. The game once again gets us reacquainted with past activities, and we're ready to take on what's left of Loren's crew. I'm out of ideas for this one. I can't even begin to think of ways to improve Zemos' intro missions. You killed Philippe Loren and showed the Morningstar that you are here to stay. Time to relax and cut loose, baby. Sometime later, Shondi gets on the phone and she's furious. Pierce decided to throw a spur of the moment party when really we should be focusing on taking down the syndicate. Boss takes a trip to Saints HQ to handle the situation because Pierce is at the top of Shondi's shit list right now. We walk in to ask Pierce about why he's suddenly throwing parties at a time like this. Zemos also needs to work on his conflict resolution skills. I was saddled up in a human pony show. Will you see me crying about a little girl? I swear to God, I will shove that thing down your throat hole. Pierce believes that it's time to move on, and that the gang can't mourn Gat forever. I know I've been beating this point to death, but refer back to the Ronin storyline. It's crazy, because Boss showed more concern about nearly losing Gat when he got stabbed by Junichi than he does when Gat dies and even in the aftermath of it all. Pierce kind of has a point. We can't mourn Gat forever, it's just that his timing with all of this is so poor. So Shondi storms off, leaving in a terrible mood. Later on, Boss and Pierce are receiving lap dances, but these dancers have more than that in mind. Indeed, these hoes ain't hoes. As you may have guessed by now, these strippers were sent to infiltrate Saints HQ undercover by the Syndicate. The Saints took over one of your properties and the best you can come at them with is stripper assassins? It's not a totally horrible plan though. It does beg the question as to how the Saints didn't bother screening any of these chicks before letting them into HQ like that. Looks like the Saints fell for the classic Trojan horse strategy. Also, this just randomly came to me, but has anybody else noticed that Troy, the undercover cop, was named after the city that was invaded using that same tactic. I love subtle things like that. Anyways, I'm getting off topic. In the middle of the assault, the power gets cut, and on top of that, we've gotta get to the roof and take care of some snipers on the other buildings. You gotta be careful when taking cover on the rooftop, because you're actually sitting next to power boxes that will explode and leave you stunned when shot. Once all the snipers are gone, we go and restore power to the place. Operating on the same speed as Internet Explorer, Oleg gives us a call and tells us to cancel the party because it's a trap. I don't know how much of the plan Oleg heard about, but he reveals that the Morningstar was supposed to bring in some attack choppers along with the undercover strippers. The helicopters are all wiped out, and the attack on the Saints is brought to an end. Elsewhere in Steelport, Kilbane isn't too happy about the botched attempt on the Saints' lives. Even Matt agrees that the plan was awful. Then Kilbane snaps. Literally. How about you, Eddie? There's a reason Philippe left the thinking to us. <sighs> We're done here. <gasps> Kilbane! Relax, you only need one of them. Kilbane crouches down and reminds Viola that she's got time to correct her mistakes or she'll face the same fate as her sister. And then he pisses on Kiki's memory by offering Viola tickets to his next wrestling match as restitution. One thing I wish is that the antagonists of this game had more cutscenes of them interacting with each other. Their scenes together are absurdly short, and we don't get to see much of the dynamics between them. The DeWinter sisters don't get much dialogue. Kilbane is just 
there until he's made into an antagonist, and Matt and Philippe are the only ones contributing to whatever conversations these guys have when they're all in the same room, and that's few and far between. Antagonists in the previous Saints Row games had extensive cutscenes with each other, whether it be them trying to figure out how to tackle the Saints, or a power struggle occurring between a leader and their lieutenant. With the main players in the Syndicate barely being fleshed out, you're left with a group of bad guys working together because, well, the Saints needed someone to fight that week. I wish we got to see their personalities and ideals clash and come together more often. That's why I love storylines like the Vice Kings, because you personally get to see how a power struggle between the major players will end, to the point where you almost want to empathize with Ben King, and that's before he gets betrayed. I think that Loren should have died somewhere in the middle of the story, and not the beginning so that we can see more of him, how he runs the Syndicate, and how his interactions with other members play out. The decision to kill Johnny so early makes me wonder how much of this game's story was written by THQ, and not Volition. Saints Row the Third has this horrible habit of introducing something, but doing nothing or very little with it. Loren is introduced and killed in a shockingly short amount of time. The Syndicate is in shambles in the wake of of Loren's death, but we don't see much of that outside of the remaining leaders debating on what to do and Viola getting her neck broke by Kilbane. Boss gives Zemos a call, and Zemos says that he's got a good plan for getting back at the Morningstar. He wants to meet up with us to fill us in on the details, though. We find Zemos watching a jumbo vision, and on the screen is Monica Hughes speaking at Capitol Hill. She says that in spite of no one taking credit for the attack on the bridge, Monica believes that the root cause of stuff like this is the glorification of gangs in pop culture and media. Because of the bridge attack and rampant gang violence, the United States Senate launches the STAG initiative. This is gonna come back a bit later. Okay, so before I continue, this mission's gonna get real weird, so just bear with me once again. Zemos has a lead that'll really hurt the Morningstar. He hands us an invitation to one of their clubs that's auctioning prostitutes. If we show them that card, we're in. The thing is, we're not going undercover as an auctioneer. Against our will, Zemos is auctioning us off so that we can act as a Trojan horse and disrupt their operation from within. So we're drugged, stripped naked, and thrown into the club. Zemos hands us our guns back, and I don't think I want to know where those mags are stored. First thing we do when we make it inside is kill the guards at the front desk and attempt to disable the alarm. Unfortunately, we've got to go farther inside to get to the security system. Just like that one Sons of Somdi mission, we're high as hell and aiming is gonna be a bit of a challenge. After blasting through some of these guys, we find ourselves in the basement. Zemos decides to free the imprisoned sex workers, and they proceed to assist us in fucking up any and all Morningstar they come across. I'm all for you guys helping out, but I'd appreciate it if you didn't get in my line of fire. Security gets disabled, and the rest of the prostitutes are freed. The brute that they send in, I kinda feel bad for, because this dude got outgunned by some naked guy. Once this mission is over, we now have Safe Word as another crib. Too bad you can't explore the rest of it, and you're confined to only navigating the penthouse portion. Some time later, Boss gets Zemos on the phone and asks for more ways they can hit the Morningstar. Zemos is sapped of ideas until Boss gets an unexpected call from Viola de Winter. She tells us that there's a container full of women being brought into Steelport by ship to replace the ones lost during the failed attack on Saints HQ. When asked to identify herself, Viola states her name and which organization she's with. Looks like we've got a new lead, so Boss tells Zemos to get Pierce and meet up at the docks. We have a boat to catch. Over at the docks, the two are able to confirm that the lead they were given is valid. All we need to do now is head over there and free the girls. If we pull this off, the Morningstar's sex operations in Steelport will be finished. Once we make it to the ship, our objective now is to go to each shipping crate and free anyone trapped inside. The thing is that you've got to play a guessing game and find out which crate contains the prostitutes and which ones are there just to waste your time. Oh yeah, and some of these containers have brutes in them. Thanks, Morningstar. After freeing all the prostitutes, we've got to clear the area so that Pierce can safely land and move these crates back to shore. This is pretty much a repeat of that penultimate Brotherhood mission, except it's less drawn out and less of a headache. Once we're done thwarting the Morningstar's maritime assault, Pierce is able to fly near the ship and grab the crate containing the prostitutes, and we're off. While flying back to Steelport, we've got to keep Pierce's helicopter safe by using the Annihilator RPG. 
This thing's real fun to use because not only does it lock on the targets for better accuracy, but it's remote controlled, meaning that each rocket will fly towards wherever you rotate the stick until the moment of impact. Think of it like the Destructo Disc from Dragon Ball. This mission is also the best place to clear the boat's destroyed challenge in the challenge list if you're looking to shoot for the Platinum. It's also a good spot to fill out some of the quota for multi-kill. The rest of this mission is pretty much just Guardian Angel. During the flight home, Matt Miller calls Boss's phone and he wants to make a deal with us. If we bring the prostitutes that we rescued back to him, he'll pay us top dollar per person. He hangs up and Boss lets Zemos know about the phone call. Zemos suggests that we bring the prostitutes back to his place instead. So in gameplay terms, if we bring them back to Matt, we'll get a huge payout from him instantly. If we bring them to Zemos, we'll get increased hourly income. Okay, so this is really stupid. At the start of the game, the Syndicate extorted the hell out of the Saints, and they also killed Gat. So why in the world would Boss of all people even entertain the idea of accepting a deal with one of the heads of the Syndicate? When it comes to storytelling, it's completely normal for characters to make dumb decisions. A character doing something stupid is not a sign of bad writing. A character doing something that's completely out of character without any kind of rhyme or reason is where things start to get iffy. Boss is known for being fiercely loyal to the Saints since the beginning of the series. Outside of getting a huge amount of cash, what does Boss gain from accepting a deal with the very same people who have been trying their best to kill him and his crew from the start? Not too long ago, these dudes sent a bunch of undercover strippers to kill you at your own headquarters. Not only that, but accepting this deal is a huge middle finger to Zemos and everything he stands for. The world of prostitution is known for coming with a lot of danger from abusive pimps and clients, but Zemos sees this and wants to make a change by treating any worker he gets fairly. He clearly has a lot of passion for keeping these workers safe while still turning a profit at the end of the day. My point is that this decision sucks and it never should have made its way into the story. Just bring the women to Zemos because it makes more sense in the grand scheme of things. Also, imagine Shandi's reaction to hearing about Boss doing business with the Syndicate. At that point, I totally wouldn't blame her for cutting ties with the crew. Over at Kilbane's casino, Kilbane is really pissed at Matt for even thinking about brokering a deal with the Saints. He makes it clear that he's the one who calls the shot, not Matt. Kilbane suddenly has an idea, and he lays it out to Matt off screen. Meanwhile in Washington, Monica Hughes announces that Stag has been deployed to Steelport, and going by the text at the bottom, the city is going to be under martial law. Things are about to get a whole lot interesting.